Hi, welcome to the Prairie Oaks Bible Study, and I'm glad you're joining me. I'm enjoying our time in Acts. We're going to look in Acts chapter 12 this morning, but we're looking at this, uh, well, on Wednesday nights we've been going through the Gospel of John, and in John 15 was one of the many times Jesus has told us that we have a opportunity with God in our prayers to ask and he will give that ask in Jesus name you've heard those um, it's God's desire that we bear fruit and that as a loving father he answers our prayers and in Acts chapter 12 we see him answer some prayers and I think it's worth looking at uh, just to give us some perspective on that. So, Acts chapter 12, let's go. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So let's pause for a second here. Uh, this is Herod uh, Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the, quote, great, who had been king when Jesus was born. So this is his grandson. And... He is kind of unpopular at times, but he's about to change that because, well, if I persecute these Christians, the rest of the Jews really like that. And so he gets started and he likes this and he's kind of got some free, uh, free reigns from Rome to do those things. Um, and so the persecution changes. You remember when it was Saul of Tarsus they were persecuting the Greek-speaking Jews who were in Jerusalem that were Christians. Now, this time it's going after the apostles because before the apostles had been protected by God. And James, one of the inner three there, uh, Peter, James, and John, you know, we know those three. Well, this is that James, the brother of John. He's killed with the sword. Uh, and when he, he did that one, and it's like, well, that really won me points. Let's go for the big one. Let's go for the top one. And so he goes for Peter, and he arrests him. But he, caught, he catches Peter right at kind of an awkward time. It's during the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's right there after Passover. And so you know, I don't want to do an execution right then. But we'll set it up and do it right after. So the crowds are still there, maybe... Uh, but it's not during a holy days. And so, puts him in prison. He knows Peter's escaped before, so he's got, you know, four squads of soldiers rotating uh, to, to watch him. As we'll find out, you know, there's two that are chained to him, and then there's two at the door. And, uh, and so, he's not going to let Peter get away this time. And, meanwhile, there's prayer. And, Verse 5 is supposed to kind of make us wonder here. So, they were praying for Peter, but they didn't pray for James. I don't think that's what Luke is saying, just because we've seen the pattern in Acts, and they were a church of prayer. But the Lord allowed not only persecution to happen in the past, and this time allowing the persecution to come even against his apostles. Jesus had warned them that would eventually come. He allowed James to die. And I'm sure if you're John and his friends and, and his family, it hurts. It's disappointing. Why? And yet at the same time, they know that uh, James is with the Lord. The Lord had told them this would come, that the world was going to hate them. And Tragedy hurts. We've had some tragedies in our own country. It seems like every week there's some. Um, and in that, it hurts.
hurts. Why is it that way? And God allows us to do some really dumb things sometimes. And we see that in Herod here. Very wicked things. And there's coming a judgment day. I don't want to be the one that God allowed to do very great wickedness and then stand before him to answer for that. But God from the very beginning allowed us to make our choices. Not just you and me, but people out there as well. And that's the decisions that they were making. But we have this confidence. No matter how good life is here, no matter the good things that could be going on, as soon as that one is ushered into the presence of Christ, they're better off. Whether you were in the best of health here and all the resources to be in the presence of the Lord is gain. And so it doesn't make it easier, perhaps, for some people but I hope it takes some of the rough edges off. Um, takes away a little bit of the bitterness. But so now the church is grieving because they've lost James. And now Peter's been arrested and pretty sure he's going to get executed. But earnest prayer is being put up for him. Verse 6. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the doors were keeping the prison. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself, tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Now, was Peter in earnest prayer at this point? Well, he probably was at some point, but here he is. He's asleep. And there is something beautiful in that. You know, there is a verse in Psalm 127. It just popped in my head. Uh, and since it's been a while since I've quoted it, I'll read it to you. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. And Peter's asleep. Peter is going to be executed in the morning, and is he worried? Is he fretful? Is he anxious? Nope. He's asleep. And I don't know what that makes you think of Peter, but that is someone who is confident in the hands of God. Is he confident that he's going to be released? Apparently not. He's just content to let God do what he wants. And he was tired. And so the same guy that he slept in Gethsemane and it was to his detriment. Here he's sleeping in prison and it's really kind of a compliment. And so the angel comes and I love it. Now, Peter has had visions before, so it kind of makes sense. But so, like, the angel's there, there's a bright light, Peter doesn't wake up. And so the Peter has to be woke up by an angel punching him in the side and saying, Come on, get up. Okay. And the chains just fall off his hands. And he's kind of standing there like, what's, what's, what's next? And so the angel has to walk him through every step. If you're one of those people that when you wake up, you're kind of slow and you kind of have to have help or a routine to get going, 
You're in good company if you consider Peter good company. And so Peter uh, has to be walked through the steps and grab your coat. It's cold outside. Okay, what's going on? And Peter is brought outside and it's when he's standing out in the cold outside of the fortress, outside of prison, that it, and the angel disappears that it finally comes to him. I like it. It says, he comes to himself and it's like, hmm. I guess it's real. It wasn't a vision. And so let's see what he does next. Um, he's been released. Verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You're beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It's his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the gardens and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So Peter comes to the house of Mary. Because apparently that's one of the places the believers gathered in Jerusalem. And it may have even been the upper room that's referenced in the Gospels. We don't know. But Luke is setting us up because he mentions John Mark, and John Mark's going to play a role in the story for a while. And that's where many were gathered together actively praying at that time for Peter, and other things probably as well. But they're actively praying for Peter. And so Peter comes, knocks at the gate, and... I want to pause for a second and think about this. It is middle of the night, and they're gathered for prayer. I don't know about you, but I'm not that earnest, apparently, in prayer that I should be, as they're praying through the night. And I realize it's easier to do that when you have people doing it with you. But uh, there's times that I have prayed through the night, but it's not the regular occurrence. I tend towards more Peter, where I tend to sleep at night. And so, they, better Christians than me, are praying. And little girl, Rhoda, translate that into English if you want and call her Rose. She hears the knocking. She comes. It's Peter. And rather than open the door, she gets so excited, she runs and tells everyone else, Hey, come see, Peter's here. And the very thing that they were praying for has come true, and yet they're struggling with believing it has happened. Which brings us to the next part of our prayer. Is that you really can't mess this up. God's going to answer. He always answers. It may not be the answer you were looking for, but he always answers. And in this case, they're praying, but they were praying probably for his trial to go well and he be released they weren't expecting anything miraculous to come. They were just praying for a normal kind of positive answer. But God sends the miraculous. And I say that to say this. You know, you may have heard people say, well, you should ask for miracles, and that's why you don't have them because you don't ask for them. They weren't asking for one, and they did get one. And so God does what God wants, but he wants us to participate through prayer. So it is a command and it is a blessing. It is a privilege to pray. And so God tells us to pray, but leave the answers to him. And so in this case, they're praying for Peter to be to be rescued and God rescues him in a way they didn't expect. Finally they realize, oh, it is him. And so Peter says, let the pastor of the church Peter lets James, the brother of Jesus, he's the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, let him know, let the other let the other apostles know, I'm going on moving someplace else. Because the reality is, 
When they come looking for Peter again, they're going to look at Mary's house because that's where the believers gather. And so he he moves on and in the thread of the stories here in, in Acts, this is the last time we hear from Peter, um, at least in a big way. Not until we get to the Jerusalem council will he show up again there. But Peter is, uh, is going to move on kind of at this point. And the guards, poor guys, they didn't have anything to do. Somehow Peter escaped from them. Um, and so God rescues Peter. He answered prayer. It was nothing against James that it didn't happen for him. And it wasn't because the church was praying for a miraculous deliverance, because they weren't. They were just praying, asking God to do, and trusting. And perhaps the most trusting individual in this was Peter, who was content wherever God wanted him to be. And yet, using prudence, you notice he didn't stay put where he could be found easily. He kept moving. Because we are to use our, our smarts. So just some thoughts on prayer. I thought it was kind of an interesting story. I had never looked at it from the angle of prayer. But it's a fun story, one you probably heard in Sunday school. But a lot of good lessons for us in it. And so let me leave you with this encouragement. This is one thing that this verse is encouraging, this passage is encouraging us to do. Is to be anxious for nothing. This is Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So pray. Don't be anxious. God is at work. He always is. And we can rest in his work. God bless. See you next time.